Ocean Hills at its best is when we are in it together. Together, Viva La Fiesta. How many of you were out there uh, this week enjoying Fiesta? I'll, see, now I love it. Let's say, way to lead. The, everybody else is kind of going, oh man, I was, in, I was out there. Yeah, I, I love it. It's okay to be out there and uh, enjoying Fiesta a little bit this week, isn't it? That doesn't, doesn't make you less spiritual. I mean, depending on what you were doing out there for Fiesta, but... Ah, I'm recovering from Fiesta. <laughs> hey, let me ask you a question. This morning, um, when you, and I'm, I'm speaking mostly to adults, but even, even to our teenagers here, high school students who are here, when you think about the way you were raised... Would you say, and I'm going to give you maybe two extremes here, but would you say you were raised more with uh, the philosophy of uh, making a buck or making a difference? The way your parents raised you. Did you grow up and the emphasis was in the things that they taught you, the opportunities they gave you, the lessons that were instilled in you? Was it more about making a buck or was it more about making a difference? I did not grow up in a faith-based home. Most of you know that. And I was never, ever taught uh, that I can remember uh, growing up that part of our purpose in life is to live beyond ourselves. I didn't grow up in an evil home or like super, you know, selfish home, but it was more just those kind of the values that we were taught is it's, it's really all about me. So you make money, so and the money I make is for me, more for me, to enjoy my life more, to travel more. I grew up in a, in a home, most of you know, that it, we, we traveled a lot, and it was wonderful to be raised in a family that showed us the world. But missing from my own development as a human being was this idea that life is beyond you and living beyond yourself is one of the great purposes of our life. Many of you know that Natalie and I last summer, I was on sabbatical for three months and, and many of you asked, why in the world you have a three month sabbatical why wouldn't you just go lay on the beach in Hawaii for three months? Why would you go to the Congo and serve and teach and find out what God's doing there in the country that is considered and rated as the neediest country on the planet today? Uh, I just read a report that in the Congo today, it is the worst place on the planet to be a mom. Worst place on the planet to be a mom is in the DR Congo. Why would you go there? And I can only say that it, it, it really is the difference that Jesus Christ has made in my life based on the way I was raised. Jesus Christ is the only explanation for why I would spend some of a sabbatical with my wife in the Congo. It's a very difficult place. Uh, place to be. I hope, I really do, I hope that, that, that all of you get a chance to go there, to touch it, to see it, to taste it, to feel it, to suffer with the people there, to, to identify with those that are there. And the reason that I bring this up is we're in this series uh, out of the book of Proverbs. It's called Dumb and Dumber. Actually, it's not called that. It's called Stop Doing Dumb Things. But um, I think this morning, one of the things that I want us to think about, when you think about stop doing dumb things, what does that mean? Here's what I think it means for us this morning. It means that God calls us to stop looking away. I did that for much of my Christian life. It was like the opportunity would come and, and I would look away. It's for somebody else. It's going to cost me too much. I don't want to give money to that. I don't want to give time to that. I don't want to go to Nicaragua. I want to go on vacation. I don't want to serve. I want to be served. And over and over again, I, I, my life kept colliding with God's word. And so I made excuses. I looked away. Even after being a follower of Christ, I have been through seasons of my life that some of you have been in or maybe are in that we call compassion fatigue. Do you know what that is? 
I mean, how many videos can you see and watch and stories can you hear? And you start kind of going, okay, I've heard this a gazillion times. And you, and, and you start, or you stop feeling what the, most of the world is feeling. And so this morning, what I want us to do is I, I want to have us look at several scriptures to remind us of this life that God has called us to live, that he's invited us to participate with him in. And the first passage I want to give to you isn't in the Proverbs, but it's out of Micah chapter 6, verse 8. If you have a Bible, and I want to invite you to bring your Bibles on Sunday morning, we are a church that, that absolutely surrenders to the authority of God's word. We want it to shape the way we think. We want it to be the loudest voice in our life, louder than the culture in which we live. We want God's word and God's spirit to be directing our steps, informing our attitudes and our choices. And the reason that it's so important is because you cannot read the Bible. You cannot read the Bible without coming to believe that God cares about every person, that every person on this planet, regardless of their religion, their age, their race, their sexual orientation, regardless of anything, every person on the planet matters to God. And because every person matters to God, every person must matter to us, to you, to me. That's the invitation, that's the call of scripture. And some of us, we wrestle with, yeah, but they deserve what they're getting. I just, somebody, uh, somebody in our leadership team sent me a video of this Baptist church in the Midwest that, you know, carries the signs. It was on, it wasn't on 60 Minutes, but it was on a Nightline thing. Maybe some of you saw it, saw it, and they're, you know, they're holding up signs about repent. God hates fags, and God hates this, and hates that, and it's just like, are you kidding me? I mean, you see this, and it gives me the cringe factor. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where you're going, I'm embarrassed to be a Christian. Are those my people? That's my tribe. And that's outside of the church. That's what many of my non-believing friends and family think the church is all about. This kind of anger, hate against this and against everyone that's not like us. That's not what the Bible teaches. This morning, my job is to help you understand what the Bible does teach. Micah chapter 6, verse 8 says this, What does the Lord require of you? Would you like to know the answer to that question? What does the Lord require of me? I, I would love to know that. Well, you know what? The Bible lays it out. He has shown you, oh man, what is good? And then there it is. If you have a Bible, underline that. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to act justly, to love mercy, and then to walk humbly with your God. What does it mean to act justly? Here's a definition. The call to act, to live justly, is to do right wherever we can, to do right wherever we can, and to stamp out wrong wherever we find it. Injustice is never tolerated, never condoned in the Bible. In fact, our country, how many of you, when was the last time you did the Pledge of Allegiance? How does it conclude? With liberty and justice for some people? Justice for all. Our country founded on a biblical value. And so what we're speaking on and looking at this morning in the book of Proverbs, I want you to know this is a spiritual issue. This is not a, I know, say, oh gosh, he's getting, this is not a political issue, or it might be, but it's deeply a spiritual issue for me. I cannot walk with Jesus Christ and close my ears to the cries of those that are suffering, those that are hurting, those that are poor, those that are oppressed, and so I'm going, to, I'm going to whip us through a few of the Proverbs that remind us of God's heart for those that hurt. 
and remind us of our invitation to partner with them. Listen to this. Proverbs chapter, and some of them will be on the screen, some of them won't. Proverbs 14, 31. Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. But whoever is kind to the needy honors God. You want to honor God? Be kind to those in need. Let me say that again. Do you want to honor God with your life? Be kind to those in need. Be kind to the poor. Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. And he or she will, re, will reward them, and, and God will reward them for what they have done. Proverbs 21, 13. Listen to this. Whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. The inference there is cry out to God and will not be answered. So our, even our prayers are connected to our actions. We're going to cry out to God, but if our lives are not filled with compassion, sensitivity to those around us, care, compassion, justice issues, advocacy issues. Proverbs 22.9 the generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. Proverbs 23, 10 through 12. Don't cheat your neighbor by moving the ancient boundary markers. Do not take the land of defenseless orphans. Proverbs 29, 7. The righteous care about justice. The righteous, those right with God, care about justice. And they care about justice for the poor. But the wicked have no such concern. That one just, it, it kind of punched me in the gut this week. But the wicked have no such, if I'm not concerned, the scriptures call me wicked. Ouch. That was like getting the wind knocked out of me this week when I read that verse. God in a sense, is looking into my heart and your heart. And he's saying, do you have concern? Do you have a heart that, 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 ha that feels some compassion? And then Proverbs 31.8, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Who is that? Speak up, speak up, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. And then, of course, if you were to go into the New Testament, you would, you would connect the dots that Jesus Christ himself, in Luke chapter 4, he talked about the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news for the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. Those that are suffering. Jesus has a heart. He wants hurting people helped. Lost people found. Matthew 25, if you've never read this text, I would say you owe it to yourself. You owe it to your own personal discipleship of following Jesus to read and reflect on Matthew 25. Of course, the famous line is, whatever you do for the least, for the least of these, you do for me. And you remember the text when he talked, when were we, when were you in prison? When were you sick? When were you without clothes? When were you hungry, thirsty, and we didn't do something about it? Whatever you did for the least of these. Who are the least of these in our world? Jesus is saying, and what are you doing about it? I've titled this message, Do Something. I love that quote. Just because you can't do everything doesn't mean that you can't do something. Just because you can't do everything, and some of us, that's where we get paralyzed. I, I can't make a difference. It's just, the need is so great. I've felt that way many times in my own spiritual life. It's just too big. I can't do it. I've seen too many videos. I can't make a difference. But just because you can't do something doesn't mean, or can't do everything doesn't mean you can't do something. And so here's what I want you to think about this morning. I believe that the scriptures call us to unleash generous, generous, generous amounts of compassion and to fight for, for issues of justice and advocacy. And so 
I want to just take a few moments to help you understand really the new missional emphasis at Ocean Hills, our new mission strategy. I want you to to think about this with me, and I'll just read from my notes for a second. I think what's most important for all of us, just because you can't do everything, doesn't mean you can't do something. If I were to say that in a, in, a, in a positive way, I think everybody in this gathering this morning, I would hope, I would pray that, that each of us would pick a cause. And so a year ago, Natalie and I said, we're going to the Congo. That was the cause that, that, that when we were there, we picked. That, it's not that the Congo is, you're more spiritual if you're involved in the Congo. For others of you, it may be uh, working with special needs uh, kids. It may be working with senior citizens who are shut in and have, and have no contact with the outside world. It may be involved in in prison ministry. It may be involved in education and tutoring. It may be involved in human trafficking. I just read in the newspaper this week that uh, last weekend, last weekend the FBI in our country did a sting operation in 76 cities in America. We think of human trafficking of mostly in Asia, right? 76 cities in this country, in the U.S. of A., and there were youth teenage girls that were being pimped uh, in sexual human trafficking in this country. For, for some of you, that cause touches your heart. I don't know what the cause of Christ is that, that touches your heart about making a difference. It could be human trafficking. It could be clean water. It could be homelessness here in our own city. It might be orphanages. It might be foster care. It might be housing and habitat for humanity. It might be spiritually lost teenagers and young life. There are so many, so many, so many great causes. Drug and alcohol recovery. There are a gazillion causes of helping those who are hurting. Here's what I want you to hear this morning. I'm not here to talk you into any one cause. But do something, right? Pick the cause that touches your heart, that breaks your heart. You know the famous quote of Bob, I think it's Bob Pierce, who founded World Vision. God, let my heart be broken by the things, the situations, the issues, the people that break your heart. And so where is God breaking your heart, touching your heart? What's the cause that, 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 that it stirs something in you, it touches you deeply, it, it, it creates a holy discontent? in you. Maybe even a holy righteous anger in you. That is not right. I'm going to stop that wrong. I want to get involved in that. I want to, I want to be part of this orphanage because those kids need to, to be given an opportunity to have a chance at living life. I don't know what it is, but I think and, and what I hope is this morning that when you walk out of here, you wouldn't walk out of here with, with, with the sense of whatever compassion fatigue but that you'd pick a cause and that you'd get involved. Maybe it's child sponsorship through compassion, through the Congo. And then I would just say partner with that cause. That's part of our new mission strategy. Rather than the church, and I'm just going to jump right into it, rather than the church kind of controlling everything, which I and, 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 and different churches function in different ways. 75 years ago, All the missional support went through the local church. There weren't all these organizations, Compassion, World Vision, all these Opportunity International, Young Life. 75, 100 years ago, these organizations didn't exist. The money was all given to the local church, to and through the local church. And then the pastors, you know, the the leadership all decided where and what missional emphasis where that would go. Today, it's totally different. All of these wonderful causes and expressions of the cause of Christ, they're out there, and you're involved with them. I was part of, uh, some of us are part of a mentoring group. In fact, we're going away to Mammoth uh, for four or five days this week. But we went around uh, one night, and I I thought it was just such a fascinating conversation. But one of the guys said, hey, let's just go around this circle of eight men that go to this church and let's just, out, out of, I don't, we don't need to know how much money you give to the cause of Christ, but of all the money you give to the cause of Christ, how much of it goes to Ocean Hills, and how much of it goes to causes, organizations, people outside of Ocean Hills? 
Now here I am, the pastor of this group, you know, and of course I'm, I'm thinking, well, I hope all seven of those guys with me are saying 100% to Ocean Hills, right? But, but each one, I, I get 50% to Ocean Hills and 50% to this missionary that our family's connected to or this cause that really touches me. And, and, and around it went. One person it was 100%, one person it was 80%, one person it was 20%, a few people 50%. And, I, and I'm not here to say right or wrong. What it said to me is, rather than try and control that, you guys, why are you doing that? You should be giving it to Ocean Hills, and then we'll support the missional causes that we think we should support. It dawned on me, no, what we want to be about as a church is to bless, to bless, to celebrate, to encourage the causes of Christ, these, these different expressions of justice and compassion where God's touching your heart because some of the issues they don't touch my heart like it might touch your heart right and so maybe whatever that cause I think what's most important that I hope you hear is something better touch your heart right if all of these causes that I've listed off none of them touch your heart then, then there's a different spiritual issue that we need to talk about but what I hope to encourage you with this morning is God's word calls us to partner, to get involved, to open our ears, to open our pocketbook to the causes of Christ where hurting people are being helped, where those that are suffering are finding uh, and, you know, that the church and the people of Christ are unleashing generous amounts of compassion and care. And so I want you to think this morning about what is the issue that touches your heart? What is the ministry that you have a heart for? And I'm going to give you a moment right now. I'm just going to just push the pause button as I'm talking. See, what Ocean Hills wants to do, we do have partners. We have many partners. I'll just tell you, you know, we have Jeff Schaefer who, was, who spoke uh, just a few weeks ago with the Uffizi Mission Order. He's helping with the homelessness issue in Santa Barbara. Now, some of you... You heard him and you went, oh my gosh, I, I want to get involved with him. That just touched me. That's awesome. Others of you were like, yeah, that's not my deal. Tim Nodhelfer works with ISI, International Student Ministries. Rather than going abroad, we have international students out at UCSB that are coming to us. This ministry is touching and reaching and transforming students who are international. It's like the mission fields come to us. That's part of their vision. And so we want to touch and transform those lives. And for some of you, that touches you deeply. And you should get involved with Tim. Alicia, Casa Victoria in Ecuador. I mean, I just go on and on. Young Life with Jamie, Lisea, Tanita, Felipe. These guys are committed, passionate about reaching spiritually lost teenagers. We have Child Hope in Haiti. We have Bridges of Hope in Ethiopia and South Africa. We have Nicaragua and Brooke down there in Los Papitos. I mean, we just go on and on. Now, what we're doing is we are, we are not any longer writing these folks into our budget. Because part of what was happening is we, would, we, we, we had them in our budget, but then in addition to us trying to support them through the Ocean Hills budget, Many of you were supporting them outside the Ocean Hills budget. And then they would do a fundraiser banquet and we'd all support them out there too. And it was like, wait a minute, how about we give them the platform? So this is what we're doing. We're choosing nine to 10 mission partners a year. The first Sunday of every month, we're gonna bring in a mission partner to cast vision, to talk about how God is using their ministry and what they've been called to do. And for some of you, you're going to be touched by that. We, 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 and we're, we're picking and choosing who we think are the all-stars that, that really are doing excellent ministry for the cause of Christ across the street here locally and around the world. And for some of you, we're hoping you're going to partner with, well, I hope all of you will partner with these different ministries that we bring in. But for some of you, one ministry will touch you. For others, another one. Are you, are you catching what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm saying? Because part of what we're trying to do is we want to bless and encourage rather than compete or try and control or feel like, well, no, wait, you're raising money and we don't want to do that. We want to just say, let's just be a church that, that affirms 
that there is a lot of generosity happening. I had a woman in our church come to me maybe a year ago, and she said this to me because we were struggling to make our budget. And she was on our board, and she said, you know, John, I think you'd be absolutely blown away if you knew how much money is going to the cause of Christ, to missional organizations, to missionaries that are dealing with issues of justice and compassion and advocacy. I think if you knew the number, not that's coming to Ocean Hills, but that, that's being given outside of Ocean Hills, she goes, I'll bet you it would be several hundreds, thousands of dollars. And she said, and we, we had this really wonderful spirited conversation about, rather than us trying to, no, no, don't give there, give it to us, and then we'll give it to there, we're changing the way we're thinking. Are, are you with me on that? Are you understanding what we're doing? And so, of course, we still want you to give to Ocean Hills because we, we, we want to continue what God's doing in and through this church. But we also, at some point, you know what we want to do is we want to celebrate the great work that God's doing through you, through the causes that God has put on your heart that you're supporting missionaries in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, in Lithuania, in wherever. I mean, we, we have people in this church that, that are giving lots of money away to missional causes to honor and glorify Jesus Christ. And we want to celebrate that. And so this morning, what I hope you'll hear is this. If you walk out of here this morning... The place not to be is to have your heart hard. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, at some level, it has to touch this. It has to touch your pocketbook at some level. If you look at your checkbook and you go, you know what, it's all for me and my kids and my iPod and my, I'm, I'm supporting Apple. Love Apple products. Woohoo! I love Apple too. If somehow the pain in this world is not impacting your pocketbook and your time, your calendar, then you got to look in the mirror and you got to say, Am I really following Jesus? Because followers of Jesus follow Jesus. Jesus. Say that with me. Followers of Jesus follow Jesus. And so read the New Testament and look at who Jesus was spending time with. Look who he was generous with. Look at who he was living this way with, who he was giving his time to. He was giving his time and generous with a lot of people, but included in that were those that were suffering and poor. Yes, he, he, he spent time with wealthy people and leaders too. But we have to have that expression if we're following Christ. Are you hearing me? Then the Proverbs teach on that. Wise people, people filled with wisdom that are skillful at living, that there's an expression in your life and in my life that shows that we have a heart for the things that God has a heart for. And that is for those that are suffering and hurting in this world. So I'm going to pause. And I'm going to have you quietly do business with God in this moment. For some of you, you're encouraged by this because you're going, I'm doing it, I'm living it. For others of you, you're like, I need to grow in this area. I, I, I think I could do more. For others of you, maybe you were like me that weren't raised with this as a value in your life. And it wasn't until I, I heard God's word taught and I came across verses like this and I went, hmm, something needs to change in my life. I need to let God have some influence with my wallet and with my time and with my heart so that I shift my attitude. It's not about me. It's about living beyond myself, loving well, living generously across the street and around the world. Let's pray. And as you sit, I invite you to pray that prayer. God, would you break my heart this morning 
with the things that break your heart? Would you put into my heart that cause, that ministry, that issue, whether it be clean water, human trafficking, foster children, homelessness, spiritually lost teenagers, seniors, you know. What is it for you? Ask God to give you a holy discontent for what's not right in this world. And then to give you the courage to do something. 